least in, you know, in my lifetime than, than right now. Um, so I, I think it starts with, you know, a, a lot of the experience that I've had with um, schools and districts thinking about this word transformation or, you know, whatever the, like, you know, concept or term of the of the day happens to be um it's you know it's morphed over my nearly 30 years um but you know it's not new for schools to be talking about wanting to do better and 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 particularly you know wanting to do better um by uh children of color and children that are um living in poverty and you know you know children who we might you know, capture under the umbrella of, you know, vulnerable youth. Um, and so this, this idea that we're going to transform is, it's not new. Um, and yet, we've never done it. Um, and, and, and there's simply no data to support the claim that we have. Um, we just, we just haven't. We, we have, schools have never effectively served the nation's most vulnerable populations. Um, not not in the aggregate. Um, and so, you know, certainly people can tell nice anecdotal stories about, you know, some poor kid or some, you know, uh, black child or indigenous child or a rasa child or whatever, right, immigrant child that, um, that they did right by. Um, but, you know, the, the truth is, is that for every, you know, nice story like that, there's um, way more and way too many stories about um, young people that didn't experience that kind of um, connectedness um, and transformational experience in schools. So um, if we are going to do it, if it's, you know, if we're going to move from, from a rhetorical commitment to, to a real commitment to transformation, then I think the starting point um, is first of all to, to acknowledge that, um, you know, to all the educators on this call, um, if you're waiting for permission, um, then stop waiting because it's, it's not going to be forthcoming. Um, and and I, I have seen no evidence that um, the, the way in which we've approached systemic change in education uh, is, is smart headed um, right headed or um, heading us in the right direction. Um, and, and the reason for that is the same reason that, uh, you know, if, if you attempted to approach all of your students in exactly the same way, that you would probably produce the results that you, that, that schools have always been producing, which is inequitable and unequal outcomes. Because, not everybody's ready to move in the same way at the same time. And I think we just need to get over that, right? This idea that we're going to do this sweeping systemic, you know, movement and everybody's going to be, it's systems change doesn't work like that. Um, so you don't have to wait for the, you know, the justice, the equity, the, the, the freedom, the transformational movement to hit your district, um, to have permission to, to be a different kind of educator today. Um, and, and perhaps no time in our professional lives has the moment better presented itself for us to, to take risks uh, and, to, and to really move very differently in the work. Um, so now is our time, right? Now is our moment for educators to grab the reins. Um, and, and I think the starting point has to be the, the question that you ask yourself as an educator, that you look in the mirror and have a conversation with yourself and with your ancestors about for what? Pub public school for what? Like we, we are taking children away from their families at age six for 13 consecutive years, for eight hours a day, for what? Right, what is the purpose of public education in a pluralistic multiracial society that was founded on two genocides that has from its inception been radically unequal and inequitable, that has from its inception categorized people in buckets that were by definition, literally like the founding documents, defined inequitable treatment 
of entire groups of human beings, entire genders, right? Were, were defined to be, right, less than. That, that's, so it, that's the starting point for us, right? Individually and collectively, right? When are we going to finally tell the truth about the foundation of the house that we're raising children in? Because if we won't do that, you know, I don't know how many of you are, are, are homeowners, um, but if, you know, if you're a homeowner, that one of the things, this, is, this example doesn't work quite as well over Zoom, but, but usually, especially when I'm only looking at two people, but when, usually when, um, when, I, when I give this example, you know, what I say is, you know, I ask the room, how many of you are homeowners? And you know, depending on who the room is and, and, and the geographical region, it can be you know, one hand if it's the Bay Area, um, or you know, more if it's administrators or you know, folks living in Iowa. Um, but um, when, when, you know, when I ask that question and you know, folks raise their hand, I ask the people who raise their hand, I say, well, when you bought your home, what was the first thing you had inspected? You know, and, and folks usually say the foundation. And I say, well, wh why the foundation? Why didn't you start with, you know, the, the, the state-of-the-art kitchen or the, the hardwood floors or the, you know, the, the, the HVAC system? Why, why the foundation? You know, and inevitably they say, because if the foundation's not right, then, then none of those other things matter. Like I can have a, you know, beautiful kitchen and a, you know, a, a, a Steinway piano and, you know, it's beautiful hardwood floors and if the foundation wrong it's all wasted it, it's you know you're throwing you're throwing good money after bad right it's all going to come in on itself well i don't think transforming the project of public education is is any different um and and i think that that's the root of why we haven't done it is because we haven't looked at our foundation we keep putting lipstick on the pig and pretending it's not a pig Right? We, we keep putting on new siding and new roofing on a house whose foundation is rotten to its core. The, the truth is, is that if you study the history of public schools, like really study it, then what you'll find is a clear and reasonable explanation for why schools are the way they are. Schools are the way they are because it's exactly how we designed them. And if we don't go back to the design, and design always begins with purpose, right? Um, purpose precedes function. And so that's where you start. And if you're for what, if you're for what is to sort young people into their proper station in life, right? Then keep schooling them. You're doing a great job. Schools are highly functional at doing that, and they have been from their outset. But I doubt very seriously that that's why any of you signed up for this gig. And it's sure as hell not why I signed up for this gig. Right? I signed up for this gig to create the opportunity for young people to dream and then have the opportunity to go after their dreams and realize those dreams, whatever those dreams might be. And that means we have to repurpose schools, right? We have to, we have to rip up the foundation and, and begin with from, from you know, everything that I understand about what works, why it works, and how it works, particularly for the most wounded ones, particularly for the most vulnerable youth, is a, a, a paradigm of wellness, that we have to start with that being the core purpose of schools that every child that engages with us, when they leave every day, they are more well than when they came in. And in order to do that, right, we have to be ethnographers of the communities that we serve, right? We have to be aware about what are the threats to the wellness of our babies and how, is, how are our schools responding to those threats with our curriculum, with our pedagogy, with our climate, with our culture, right? With the way in which we distribute resources, with the way in which we, we decide about uh, what gets funded and what doesn't get funded, with the ways in which we think about which teachers we recruit, which the ways in which we think about which teachers do we support, which teachers do we develop, how do we support them, how do we develop them, it's, right? The, the list gets pretty long, right? 
But that list can take you in a million different directions if you don't have a clear compass, if you aren't, if you aren't lucid about what your true north is, right? You can be pulled in a million different directions because schools forever have suffer, suffered from initiative fatigue. And they suffered from initiative fatigue because they don't have a true north. So they're constantly vulnerable to snake oil, right? And, and so that's the starting point. And if your district doesn't have a true north, right, that's a systems problem. And you can't let that become your problem as an individual educator. And the more that you are clear on your true north, the easy it is to connect with other educators that have that same true north. And I, the, the other real threat to reorienting yourself to your true guided purpose, your sacred purpose, your sacred path in this work is isolation. That if you think you're the only one, right? If you lock yourself in your classroom every day, or in this case, your living room or your wherever you're doing your right class from, right? But, but you know, the, the oldest strategy of war is divide and conquer. And the more that they get us operating individually, right, instead of collectively. And I mean, this is the kind of classroom we try to build. But then professionally, we often don't do that or we wait for the school to do that. And I think that one of the things that's allowed me to stay in this work so long and to continue to do the work in a way that, that, that hasn't always vibed well with the, the, you know, the district that I worked in or even the school that I worked in was to make sure that I was um, intentional about having a, a collective uh, vision about myself as a professional educator and to making sure that I was consistently and intentionally connecting with my colleagues to make sure that I wasn't crazy and to make sure that I didn't feel isolated in the ways in which I was trying to do the work oftentimes very differently then I heard the institution talking about wanting to do the work. And so, you know, I think that for me, those are the pieces, right? But it always comes back to you as an educator and the conversation that you're willing to have with yourself and your ancestors about, are you really walking your sacred path? Are you really doing the work that you originally signed up to do when you chose this incredibly high paying profession. You guys get, okay, kids. <laughs> right, it's you didn't choose it for the money, right? You chose it because it's in your sangre, it's in your blood, it's in your DNA, it's, it's in your spirit. And if, if that's really why you chose it, and I can't imagine any other reason why you would have, then, then recentering yourself around that, reminding yourself about your true north is essential to you being able to transform your practice and you being able to do the things that are hard to do when they're most needed, right? It's easy, everything works on the whiteboard. But can you be the educator that you always wanted to be when a child shows up, a wounded child shows up, right? That, that is not the apple of your eye, right? That is not, that is not right, compliant, that is, not, that is literally challenging every thread in your soul, right? That's the moment when it is most important that you have a clear compass. And if you find yourself unable to muster the courage, character, and commitment, to meet the needs of the most wounded children. It's not the child, it's you. You've lost your true north. And if you can recenter, if you can do that work, right, then your well is deeper, you're more available, your gaze is wider for the children that need you the most. And I think that the mistake that we make when we try to transform the classroom, the school, our curriculum, our pedagogy, our experience, is that we try to change the child instead of trying to change ourselves. There, there is nothing wrong with the children. All that's happening is they're reflecting back to us the society that we've built. And if you wanna change how wounded children show up, 
then you've got to change the society that's wounding them. And it is my firmly held belief that the most likely way to transform our society is by transforming the educational spaces that we put children in. I do not believe that our adult generation will do it. And clearly there's a lot of evidence to suggest that our adult generation is pushing us radically and, and, and aggressively faster towards the cliff, which is why I've never left direct work with schools and young people because they are the, the, frankly, the only hope that I have for us to course correct. And I genuinely believe, like I believe this to, to my core, that we can do it in one generation. If schools would just choose, just decide that for the next generation, the, the only, only purpose, purpose of school, of school will be youth will be wellness. wellness. If we made that decision as a nation, then in one generation, we could course correct. Because the young people that would be coming out of schools, their sensibilities about justice, right? About um, inequity, about all the form, white supremacy, male supremacy, hetero supremacy, uh, 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 patriarchy, class supremacy, language supremacy, xenophobia, all those things. If that was, right, wellness around all those things was our focus every day, all day for 13 consecutive years, the purpose of reading, the purpose of writing, the purpose of math, the purpose of science, the purpose of recess, the purpose of play, the purpose of sport, the purpose of band, the purpose of student leadership, if that was the purpose for just one generation of young people, the conversations would change. But I don't see any other way. You know, we, we can't keep tinkering around the edges because the forces that have and continue to push us the other direction are just too powerful. And so if not now, if not during a double global health pandemic, if, if that is not going to be the point at which we say schools are going to be about and for wellness, then when? When will that, when? Like what, what more impetus do we need than this moment right now, right? And that's why I agreed to do this, this talk with y'all, right? On such short notice because this is our moment. It really is. And, you know, I'll say before we move on to the next question, if I can support you in any way, individually as a, as a collective beyond, you know, this, you know, whatever this is, um, to, to do that, please don't hesitate to reach out because we, we really are, like our community really is trying to build a movement right now of educators all over the country that are, that are feeling in a similar way. Like, okay, we're not, we're not asking anymore. We're telling now that it's gonna be different and it's gonna be this way. And, and you're gonna have to lean on the community and you're gonna have to lean on the practitioners now for guidance because you've been misguiding us for far too long. And, and, and we're just not, we're not gonna do it anymore. Thank you. Well said. And as a follow-up, you know, the, the gold standard, you know, they say in education is data, data, right? Be data driven. And, and I, I'm wondering if you can unpack the, the, the leading uh, lagging sort of indicators, because cause what you're saying is backed by the best science we have, right? Yeah. It, it, it's so the, the gold standard of practice is not data. <laughs> the gold standard of practice is differentiated instruction, right? And it's been that way for 40 years. You know, the, the, and, and you know, what I often tell, you know, educators and, and, and school leaders and, and policymakers is that the, the only place where we are still debating this is, is amongst ideologues. I mean, the, the research community, the, there is no debate about what I just said, zero. And I'm talking about like across research communities, whether you're talking about 
public health, social epidemiology, neuroscience, physiology, epigenetics, uh, child development, psychology. There is, I'm telling you, there's no debate in the research community about what I just said. Um, so, you know, what I tell practitioners is, is that, that engaging in that debate, engaging in an ideological debate with people that are not moral is a waste of your time. So don't do it. It's, it there is no debate. It's the false debate. Okay. So then if, if you know that, right, then, 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 then I think the way you spend your time instead of in debate is in study. Right. And, and, and when you study what it, what works and why it works and how it works, um, the recurring themes are, are pretty lucid. And, and those recurring themes sort of run parallel in the research community for about the past four decades. They're, they're pretty much the same. Like the, the most successful practitioners, um, if, if you look at research about right, what they're doing, um, it's, it's pretty much like there's no, there's not some pixie dust, you know, that you acquire and then you blow it on kids and then they're like, you know, these perfect, it, it's the same practices. Um, now where they need to be nuanced is, um, and so the term that we've been using in, in, in our work is, is that they need to be community responsive, right? So what, what right, what care and love look like? Um, in community X and community Y need to, they, they need to look different, right? But, but if you go to community X and community Y, you will see in the most successful classrooms, care and love, right? For sure, right? But the way it manifests, right? Um, the way it looks in the curriculum, the way it looks in the pedagogy, the way it looks in the climate and the culture um, is responsive to the particular cultural norms of the community. And so it's important that you are um, uh, studying the, the concept of culture and you're not essentializing it, right? You're not essentializing culture as a proxy for race and saying, oh, well, I'm working with these native kids, right? And I know about this native program on the res in Albuquerque that, that you know, worked great. So I'm just gonna like cop, carbon copy over the curriculum and the, 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 the way the day flowed and all that because these are all native kids. No, they, it doesn't work that way. That, 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 that you, you have, that's why I said you have to become an ethnographer of the community that you serve. And certainly you could look at, well, what's worked for, for native kids in other places? But then you have to make that responsive to the particular climate and culture of the, of the indigenous youth that you're serving in your particular community. And if you're not from that community, and if you're not native, then you can't do that without them. And you can't drive it. You have to humble yourself, right? And you have to ask, and you have to listen, and you have to respond to what it is that our community is telling you. We know what we need. We don't need you to save us. We need you to support us, right? We need you to humble yourself and understand that we were here before you came and we will be here after you leave. So that, that means that we've got some wisdom that you cannot possibly have. And if you can humble yourself to that, then you can mix medicines with us. We're not saying we have all the answers. But we are saying that our answers for our own children should come first because they're our children. And we would never presume to tell you how to raise your children. So you shouldn't do that with us. But we can raise our children in community, but we can't raise our children exactly the same. And so your cultura, your, your ancestors, your histories, your teachings, they're medicine. Right? We, don't, we don't disrespect those. We want to learn those too. We want to hear about those, but only to the degree that you have the same level of reverence and respect for our histories and our ancestors and our cultura. And then we can be more powerful together because you can bring your medicine and we can bring our medicine and we can mix that medicine and then we can live in harmony. This is the only way. There is no other way. Right? There's no slick shortcut to that, right? And so, so 
what does that mean for, for data? Well, data is the coin of the realm right now. You are right about that, right? It's not the gold standard of practice, but it is the coin of the realm. And so if you want the keys to the kingdom, then you've got to be able to, to, to think more uh, with a greater level of complexity about how to use data. Now, the truth is, is that our communities have always used data, right? We've always collected data, but just not necessarily in like pie charts and bar graphs, right? So, so there's a very sort of Western, right, institutional way that we have this data conversation, right? But there's also a way in which um, we could learn from uh, indigenous peoples and, and people that are outside of the dominant culture, right, about other ways to talk about data, other ways to think about data. And I'll give you an example, right? My abuelita always knew how we were doing. And she always knew how we were doing as her, her, as her grandchildren because she always collected data on us, right? She knew, I, I'm the youngest of seven kids. Right? And we would all represent differently. But because she was always collecting data on how we behaved and how we showed up and how we represented grief and how we represented joy and how we represented loneliness and how, right, then she could read our body and our energy, right, and be community responsive. She could give us equity. Equity is when you give people what they need when they need it. And that means you have to collect data. But then the question is, well, what data are we talking about here? And the problem with the data that schools have been collecting, and let me just be clear, I'll go back to my original statement, that, that if, you, if you understand the historical purpose of schools, then you understand exactly why we're collecting the data that we're collecting. It makes total sense. But the data that we are collecting is not about wellness. And the data we are collecting is not about the journey to wellness because the data that we are collecting from, and now I'm going to speak to you as a researcher. Okay. So as somebody who is very well trained in how to collect data, how to analyze data and how to present data. Okay. I can tell you that the data that schools are collecting is what, methodologically in the research community we refer to as data that shows lagging indicators okay meaning they are the tail on the dog okay so reading scores don't wag the dog the dog wags the reading scores okay so everything that we're looking at right now in schools is what we mean by lagging indicators is those are post outcome data, right? So that data is not without its use, but if you're trying to transform a system, it is virtually useless, okay? And you don't have to take my word for it. Read the research on systems change. The best minds in the world will all tell you that if you want to transform a system, you don't look at outcome data. Because all the outcome data tells you is what you produced. It does not tell you why you produced it. And if you want to transform a system, you have to understand the leading indicators. The leading indicators are the things that lead to the lagging indicators. And if you move the dial on the leading indicators, then the lagging indicators take care of themselves. So then why look at lagging indicators? Because if your lagging indicators aren't moving, it means you have the wrong lead indicators. So if you want to change the outcomes that you're having with an individual student, I'll get that, that granular with you, okay? I'm not talking about all your Latino students or all your indigenous students. I'm saying just pick one kid, right? The, the kid that gives you homicidal thoughts. Don't lie, we all have at least one of them, okay? I'm raising two of them right now, right? They're, they're all, if you can see my photo, you can see that they're right behind me, okay? 
Um, so, um, so you just think about that one kid who's like, you just, you can't seem to, to, to reach him. You can't seem to have that, right? The moment that you signed up to have. So, and then I want you to think about, well, what is the data you're looking at to figure out whether or not you're making progress with that young person? And it's almost certainly um, all lag data. His reading score isn't improving, right? His attendance isn't improving. His behavior isn't improving. Those are all lag indicators. What you want to become a student of is what are the lead indicators that actually result in him having better behavior, in him uh, having better attendance, in him being more committed to learning how to read. Okay, that's where you want to focus your energy. Because what happens is, is when you change the data you look at, you change the questions you ask. And when you change the questions you ask, you change the answers you come up with. And if those answers don't get you the change that you want, what that tells you is you're still looking at the wrong data. You're still looking, you're still asking the wrong questions. And so you keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And that's what differentiated instruction is. That's also what good parenting is. It's not a lot of difference, right? I have twin boys. I have twin boys that are seven years old. They do not learn the same. They do not emote the same. They do not play the same. And they're twins. You couldn't have kids that are more aligned, right? In every single way. But I can't raise them the same. Now I can have the same set of standards and expectations for them. But the way that I create the pathway and support the pathway for them to meet those standards and expectations has to look different, right? So then what are the lead indicators? Well, there's also no debate in the research community about the answer to that question. The lead indicators are the indicators of wellness. So I'll name a few, right? Um, food, clothing, shelter, and safety, right? Basic needs have to be met for higher order engagement to happen. So that has to be the baseline in your classrooms and your schools, especially now, right? And now that's a more complex picture because they're not showing up to your classroom. So you have to get, you have to become a creative. You have to be dynamic in how you respond to the questions about food, clothing, shelter, and safety. If you get food, clothing, shelter, safety, right? Then it's it, the, the next tier, okay, is, um, a sense of love and belonging, right? Do children feel loved? And do they feel a sense of belonging when they're in your space? And ideally, right, you're, you're, you're working outside of your space, but you also have to acknowledge your locus of control. You don't control the fact that we live in a racist, classist, homophobic, patriarchal society. You don't. So, Kids are gonna go out into that environment and if they are brown kids, if they are poor kids, if they are girls, if they are non-gender uh, conforming, non-binary gender conforming, right? All of those kids are gonna experience threats to their wellness by virtue of the society we built. That's why you are so important because they will go to you for medicine. They will go to you for armor to protect them from the attacks, the microaggressions, and the mega aggressions that they will experience when they go out in our society. That's why your work is so important. That's why the space that you create is so important. That's why tracking love and belonging, getting data around that is so important. Because if they're toxified in the broader society, when they come to your space, if your space does not interrupt that, then it is compliant and complicit with it. There is no neutrality here. You have to aggressively attack the toxins that young people are coming into your space with. 
The best educators are medicine people. The best educators are healers. And you can't heal and you can't give medicine if you don't know what's ailing the child. So the third tier, if, there's, if, if yours is a space of love and belonging, right? Then, right, the third tier is about cultural identity, self-esteem, self-love, okay? So that they, 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 they feel, right, that this is a place where I belong. They feel that this is a place that I am loved, but then they got to go inward. Do you love yourself for who you are, for the color of your skin and the texture of your hair and the language that you speak and the community that you come from and your ancestors? This is why ethnic studies saves lives because it gets you to that third tier where you, you learn about your own sacred value. You, you learn that you are a blessing. One of the best teachers I've had for this, a great resource that y'all can tap into, um, is the, the teachings of, of Maestro Jerry Theo. Okay, we can put that in the chat box. Jerry with a J and Theo, T-E-L-L-O. And uh, he's uh, one of the founders, if, if not the founder of the, um, the National Compadres Network. And they have an amazing curriculum, amazing trainings to support people around this concept of, um, of seeing every young person as a blessing. And, and, and the key there is that you see children as blessings when they least deserve it because that's when they need it the most. Okay? And that's the place where we're the least likely to see them as a blessing. That's a place where we're the most likely to, to get them out of our class because they're terribly inconvenient. Right? And that's the moment we have, when we have to muster the courage, character, and commitment to really remember our purpose. So um, the, the, when we get, and basically what I'm reciting to you is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, that's, that's, all I, that's all I just did, right? Those three tiers, that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Before I you know, move off of this point, I wanna say very clearly that, that while, while probably everybody on this call and everybody in your buildings is, is aware of, the, uh, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They've heard of it. They have some sense about, you know, what it, what it means. They, like, they can visualize kind of the peer, right, all that. I doubt very seriously that, that very many of you and very many people in your building know that Maslow's hierarchy of needs was appropriated from indigenous people. And if you study, this is why Malcolm X said of all the forms of study, the one that's most likely to reward your efforts is the study of history because the truth is lying there, okay? And so if you study Maslow, right, and you go back to his early writings, Maslow himself talks about the fact that he was completely upside down in the way in which he understood the hierarchy of needs. And Maslow's proposal was that the hierarchy of needs was victory. Maslow's proposal was that the hierarchy of needs was to win in conflict. And one of his mentors, who was a woman, not surprisingly, right, said, you're wrong. This is when Maslow was like a newly minted PhD in New York, right? So, of course, he, he, he knew way too much, right? And uh, his, one of his elders and his mentors was this, you know, older white woman who was, um, uh, you know, much wiser, right? And she said, and he was presenting this at this kind of small collective of some of the most um, prestigious scholars in New York. And she was, she was kind of the, the kind of big head of that group, right? And so he makes this present, this impassioned presentation and, and, and she says, you're wrong. And he, you know, of course, you know, debates her and she says, all right, look, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe you have like stumbled on it and, and you know, you're, you're right. So here's what I'm going to suggest that you do. I want you to go spend the summer on the Blackfoot reservation and learn from them about what wellness is. Learn from them about what needs are. And then come back and tell me if you think you're right. So he does. 
she sets him up. He, and so there's, there's tons of pictures of Maslow, you know, on the Blackfoot res, right? Learning from indigenous healers, learning from, right? The Blackfoot, um, the, what they call the breath of life, right? Which is their own, right? Hierarchy of needs. And Maslow completely changed his framework. And so the framework that you are looking at, right? Is the framework that Maslow took away from his time with indigenous people. And indigenous people have roundly and rightly critiqued Maslow's framework, right? As not reflective of an indigenous framework of wellness because Maslow's framework is still an individualistic framework. It's about the individual child have their individual needs met, individual, right? And that is not an indigenous paradigm and it is not a wellness paradigm, right? That is also toxic, but it doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to the individual child's needs, but it goes back to the first thing I said, just like everything I say, will go back to the first thing I said, that if you are doing individual wellness for a child, you have to ask yourself for what? And if you're doing that so that they can go to college and get a nice profession and a nice job and a nice house and never have to suffer again, then you are adding to the toxicity. Because that is not success. Success is what I've often said is, is that the purpose of public education is not to escape poverty. The purpose of public education is to end it. And we are developing models of escape pods, right? The deserving few get to get out. The deserving few, the ones that will just come and put up with our bullshit, right? Then they don't have to suffer anymore in poverty. Meanwhile, poverty persists because we haven't taken the indigenous wisdom of it's all of us or none of us. And so I encourage you to think about Maslow's paradigm, okay? as the starting point for the indigenous paradigm, the breath of life or the indigenous model, which is um, at the base is Maslow's um, pyramid, or excuse me, pinnacle. So Maslow's pinnacle is self-actualization. If you look at indigenous frameworks, the indigenous framework has self-actualization at the base. It's the starting point, right? It starts with you being well, and then for what, okay? Second tier in the indigenous framework is community actualization. Your accomplishments, your growth, your knowledge, your wisdom is only for service to the community. Everything that you are gaining and got garnering, right? Is to create more wellness in the community. Right? right, not to build walls around yourself so that you can be safe while others suffer. That's the colonial model that is making us so sick. The collective model is to say, yes, we want you to thrive. Yes, we want you to get A's. Yes, we want you to go to college. But the question is for what? And the for what is so that you can cure cancer so that you can end global pandemics, so that you can end white supremacy, so that you can help us end male supremacy, so that you can help us end class supremacy, so that you can help us end this radicalized inequity, so that you can help us end the colonial project. That's why you study. That's why you read. That's why you write. That's why you do math. That's how you get kids to engage. When you're talking to kids that don't know Harvard from Howard, talking to them about college going is just a teacher game. They don't understand what you mean. But when you talk to them about their abuelita being well, about their tío who has type two diabetes and cancer being well, when you talk about having clean water, clean land, that okay, gives young people a real reason to study that they will grab onto. And that is the paradigm, right? The third tier in the indigenous framework okay, is cultural perpetuity. So your community actualizes 
right? For what, right? So that the best of our cultura, right, comes back to our children, right? That our children see, oh, that's why you study. That's why you work so hard, right? Is so that everybody can thrive. Right, and, when, and that's what we mean when we talk about a model of wellness for schools. Thank you, that was well said. And uh, one of the things that I see a question uh, is, and you kind of talked about it last week, but you know, oftentimes we're, we're in these circles and talking to, to people that, that are already on the, are somewhat on the same page as us if we're, you know, fighting for social justice equity uh, in the schools. And so how do we inspire demand change while working with the educators who need, need to be our partners because they're in the ones in the jobs, but maybe not showing up to the meetings that they need to be at or the trainings that they need to be at? How do, how do you, how, cause I feel like that's a big part of your work. You're able to, to, to connect with multiple audiences, multiple communities. How do we, how, how do we do that? Um, I, I think the, the advantage that educators have um, to answering that question is that you already know the answer to that question. You just don't like it. Right? So it's, it's, it's really not about you figuring something out that you don't know how to do. It's about mustering the courage, character, and commitment to do the things that you don't really want to do, <laughs> which is to work with adults. Right, like m most of us signed up to do this work because we wanted to work with young people, not not really realizing that oh, man, that means I also got to work with grownups. Um, and so you know, I, I think that the 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 model isn't really all that different than what you do in your classroom. You know, the 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 the, the question is 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 you know, can you see your colleagues as learners? You know, can you see them? As, as wounded people? Can you see them as people who went through the same school system that I was just talking about, that didn't teach them to love themselves, that didn't teach them how to have healthy relationships, that didn't teach them how to, right, how to, how to ask for help, how to be collective, right? How, they, I mean, just think about the design of the classroom. Think about the design of schools. You know, talk, talk to architects. They'll tell you that the architectural design model name for how schools are built architecturally is the cell and bell model. That's literally what it's called in, in architecture, the cell and bell model. And there's only two places where it's used. Schools and prison. Because prisons are designed for isolation and so are schools. So if you go to, like I, I've spent, you know, nearly 20 years working with the Maori community in New Zealand. The, and, you know, the, the Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand, for those of you that are not familiar with kind of global indigenous politics. Um, and in, in, in Maori schools, um, there's no walls. I, I shit you not, I couldn't believe it. I was like, ha, ha, like in a, in a Maori middle school, there's no walls. Uh, oh man, that would, this would be chaos, like middle school with like, no, it's not. It's beautiful. It's, it's vibrant. It's not cell and bell. You know, kids are not, and it forces you pedagogically to operate differently. You can't do teacher centered stuff without walls. You can't stand and deliver. You can't put kids in cemetery rows. You've got to do group work. You've got to do collective projects. You've got to do mixed age stuff. You've got to collaborate with your colleagues. You can't just have your own lesson plan, close your door, lock it, any late kids are screwed, and then you're just gonna like do your thing for eight hours. Can't happen, can't happen. So we are pinned into this architectural design, right? But it doesn't mean that we have to accept it. So. You know, I think that, that what, what, what I often advise educators to do as a starting point is to pick one person, pick one person at your, in your building that you are going to start building with, that you are going to start collaborating with, 
okay, that you are going to invest in one purpose or one person who you're going to get off the fence. So there's, a, I wrote an article um, that I can, you know, share with you and then you can share with the group if, if, if they're interested. But I, I did a study, um, this, is, this is quite some time ago um, in, in LA. When I was at UCLA, I, I did a, a three-year study of um, this small group of really successful teachers, um, most of them in South LA. Um, and um, it was, you know, cross-cutting their elementary school teachers. Um, there was a middle school teacher, there was high school teachers. Um, and, and what I was looking for was, um, was whether or not there was an archetype. You know, is there an archetype of like the highly effective, you know, educator for you know, marginalized youth? Um, and w w what I can say definitively after that study is no, there's not. Right? There isn't a set of boxes that we can have somebody check off and then say, oh, yep, they're going to be great. Okay? But what I did find and what I think that the, what I know the research supports um, with, with quite a bit of depth and rigor um, is that while there is no archetype, um, there are a set of practices that all of the most successful educators use consistently. And they're time honored. They really, they, they really haven't changed all that much. What they look like has changed because, right, how kids are showing up and what their needs are has changed. But the, but the, the kind of like the, the higher order, right, practices, um, the, the kind of philosophical practices, they, they haven't changed. They're pretty much the same. So in that study, what, what I noticed. Um, and then, and I always sort of noticed this, right, as a teacher, as a researcher, but then, then I started hearing young people talk about it. Like when I would interview the young people, I started hearing them talk about it. And what I realized is, is that in, in virtually every school I've ever been in, there's basically three groups of teachers, okay? And, and I just want to be clear with everybody that um, every one of us is always all three of these teachers. Okay, like it's not like you get into one bucket and then you're just good, right? You're like these three teachers live in all of us, and it really is, it has to be an intentional and purposeful, right, decision that you make about how you're going to fight off those other teacher identities, right? To sit in the identity that is really the one that kids need the most. So the three identities are, um, and I didn't come up with these names. It was actually the children who they, they would literally would say, say to me, there's three types of teachers in this school. There's gangsters, okay? And these are the teachers that like hate us. They, we, and we know they hate us. They don't like our families. They don't like our community. They don't like our neighborhoods. They don't like the way we dress. They don't like the way we talk. They don't like the music we listen to. They don't like the food we eat they think we're the problem and there's not a lot of them but there's a couple and we can tell you who they are and they are really outspoken right so they're the ones who dominate your staff meetings when you start talking about cultural responsiveness indigenous wisdom you know ethnic studies right these are the folks who him and ha and they roll their eyes and they say oh here we go again with the you know like why aren't we just like you know disciplining these kids and we just need to get these kids out of here and we just need more cops and you know what, whatever right and we all know you know those teachers we all know those colleagues that we have um and but the good news is is there's they're few and far between they're in every school i've ever been in right but but most teachers are not that jaded right and that racist that that they're that they're you know they're, they're sort of that far gone okay so the problem with the gangsters is is that they tend to get way too much attention and we tend to get especially those of us you know fighting for the other side of that coin we tend to get really consumed with them right um and i think that's a mistake so let's just put gangsters to the side for a second. The second group of teachers that kind of sits on the opposite side of that um, paradigm are the teachers that kids call riders. Okay, these are the teachers that like that teacher will ride or die for me. Like they'll do anything for me. They always have my back. You know th that kind of teacher. That's the community responsive teacher. 
That's the teacher that's an ethnographer of the community they serve. That's the teacher that's in the community talking to families about how can I do better? What do you need, right? Um, those teachers, sadly, are also few and far between. But they're on every campus I've ever been in, and they're not always teachers, right? Sometimes it's the custodian. Sometimes it's the front office person. Sometimes it's the, you know, the principal. Not very often, but you get my point, right? Like there's, it, when I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about teacher big T, okay? Teacher small T is a job, okay? Teacher big T is a way of life. So there's lots of teachers on our campuses, right? But they don't all have the title teacher, okay? So, um, and, but young people acknowledge it, right? Young people acknowledge that person is a writer. Like if I really need something, I can go to that person and it, their institutional power doesn't matter. They will, they will help me. They will support me, okay? That's a writer. And those folks get far too little attention because their classrooms aren't on fire, right? They're not kicking kids out right and left. So nobody's really paying all that much attention to them. And that is also a mistake because they have answers that, that and nobody's going there, right? So the, the third group, which is the bulk of teachers, is what the teachers call these kids wanksters, okay? And, and, and the, that term, you can sort of figure out when this study happened because wankster was a very popular cultural term at the, the time because the, the hip hop artist 50 Cent, right, had this song that talked about wanksters, right? But basically the wankster was somebody who's always talking about what they're gonna do and they never do it. Right, so this is the teacher that's like, you know, this is gonna be my year. Like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna really have a breakthrough with Johnny and just like it never happens, right? And they just kind of default back to this benign, you know, work ethic. Um, and so the metaphor that I use to answer your question is, because what you're talking about, Virgil, is you're, you're talking about um, change, right? You're talking about how do we, right? Um, impact our colleagues. And if you, if you think about your school, okay, or the place where you serve right now as a system imbalance, okay, and, and, and my guess is it probably is. And one of your first mistakes might be thinking that the school that you work in is broken. And I would just challenge your thinking to say that, you know, that it's probably not. And the way that I would know that it's not broken is by um, whether or not your outcomes are predictable. And my guess is that every single teacher on this call could tell me, you don't need to tell me the name of the school you teach in. You don't even need to tell me where it is. All you have to do is tell me who goes there. And if you tell me who goes to your school, I can predict achievement right now and in June, I'll be right. And yeah, it might be a couple outliers. I might miss a couple times, but I could do that for basically any school in the United States. And I'd be right way more often than I'm wrong. That y'all is a system imbalance. Systems in balance produce predictable results. Systems out of balance are unpredictable. So, your goal as a teacher is not to get your system in balance. Your goal is to knock your school out of balance because your school is trying to maintain a status quo paradigm and you're trying to disrupt the status quo paradigm. So if your school is a system in balance and on the outside of the, just picture, I don't even know if you can see my hands right now, but we'll just pretend, okay? And if this is radio, then I'll be a little more descriptive, okay? So just picture a balance scale. And on, on the outsides, of the, on the two trays on the outside, sit the gangsters and the riders, okay? And they're fairly inconsequential in the balance of the system. The key to the system is the wankster. The key to the system is keeping the majority of the people in a benign practice. 
straddling the fence, non-committed. So you've got all these people sitting on top of the balance scale, not tipping it either way. So I'm assuming that everybody on this call is fighting to be a writer, okay? You aren't, because nobody ever is all the time, right? You have gangster tendencies, you have wangster tendencies, and you have writer tendencies. But you are on this call right now because you're trying to figure out how do I spend more of my time in rider status. Okay, so to answer your question, Virgil, I think that the move is that the folks that are fighting to be riders, right, pick a wangster. And they say that they're gonna invest in that relationship. And they're not just gonna stay off the fence, they're gonna pull somebody with them. And if even one of you did that in your school, what would happen to the balance? It would tip to the rider side, marginally, right? Just by one person. But you have to understand okay, the physics of gravity, that once that tips even a little bit to the rider side, the gangsters are no longer on level ground and neither are the wangsters. So if you get one off the fence, gravity starts working in your favor and the second one comes off easier and the third one comes off easier. And, the, and each time that happens, the gangsters are less and less comfortable. It's slippage, they're sliding. And which direction are they sliding? They're sliding toward wangster status. And once they get to wangster status, you got a shot to get them to rider status. That's how you create a tipping point. You don't do it systems wide. You don't say everybody's gonna be a social justice educator. Everybody's not ready to be a social justice educator. Do we need everybody to be a social justice educator? Yes, that's not the question. The question is how? And the way that we do it is, is that those that are already committed, they make a commitment to making somebody else so committed. And then hey, the conversation with that person has to be, okay, now your responsibility is to pull somebody else off. Because wankster number two may not be able to learn from the rider. They're not ready, but they can learn from wankster number one. Because when they look at wankster number one, they're like, damn, you were just like me six months ago. Most people, in my experience, that are doing this work want to be successful with our children, and they just don't know how. And if you know how, and you really care about these children, you have a responsibility to be a teacher of teachers. Because if you teach another teacher what you know, you just exponentially increased your impact on children. Because now it's not just what you're doing, it's what the person that you taught is doing. And that's how we create a systems shift is that we invest in each other. Thank you. That's, uh, I see uh, we have about four minutes left. Uh, I wanted to maybe a quick, uh, I don't know uh, about this, but maybe you do. We have a, a question from uh, Chris Evans and he was wondering your thoughts about big picture learning. And if you're familiar with that and in, in, in your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, their, their CEO just, uh, sent me an email this morning asking me to participate in this really cool project that they're doing, um, which I'll, I'll tell you all about um, just so you can tap into it. Um, it is called, too many messages from Virgil this morning. Um, <laughs> it's, it, the brother's name is Carlos Moreno and they're doing something called um, Books with Brothers. Um, and it's just uh, men of color, um, all over the country that they're asking to pick um, a children's book that we, they then record us reading. Um, and then they make that reading available um, to, you know, other folks. Um, so anyway, it's, it's funny that, that that came up because he just literally just emailed me this morning asking me if I would be, would it be a reader for that project? And I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, so if, Carlos, if you're listening, I know you're not, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm in there. Um, Look, <laughs> big picture, small picture, like it's just games to me. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I honestly do not think that programs work. 
um, I, I think people work. And, 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 and that doesn't mean, you, you'll never catch me saying programs don't matter, right? And they do, of course they matter. You know, of course ethnic studies matters. But, you know, you, you, can you do ethnic studies badly? Yeah, you can, right? So, you know, big picture, a big picture school is as good as the people that are, that are in practice there, right? It's not the model, it's the people. So look, you know, I, I have issues with big picture that they are well aware of, like they brought me to keynote, you know, at their schools and, and you know, it, sure, like, does that, is, that, is that model a good one? Sure, if it does the things that I talked about. But I've seen big picture, you know, hyper focus on college going and career pathways and all of these things, right? Um, at the expense of their most vulnerable young people being taken care of. And that's not big picture. It's sure as shit not my big picture, right? It is, it's somebody's big picture, but that's not my big picture. You know, look, I, I said this to a group of superintendents once. This is the best way I can say it. I was in a room full of superintendents and we were talking about data, right? And I said, okay, look, uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna do, we're gonna do a little exercise right here. I'm, I'm gonna engage you in, 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 what, in, in the research community when we do surveys, it's, there's a certain type of survey, it's called a forced choice survey, um, where you, you have to pick one answer, okay? Um, no, no him and Han, you know, no political rhetoric, no, like you've got to pick. So here we go. Forced choice. Option one. Oh, and by the way, I'm not talking, this is me talking to the superintendents right now. Okay. So just pretend y'all are, you know, superintendents. So by the way, we're not talking about the children in the schools that you govern. That's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about your children. Like, literally your sons and daughters. And if you don't have any children, pretend, okay? So your children, your flesh and blood, forced choice, option one, your child scores in the 90th percentile in every single currently used national academic metric reading, writing, math, science, you name it, 90th percentile. And they score in the bottom quartile for all the measurements of wellness. Option two, your child scores in the 90th percentile for all the measurements of wellness. And they score in the bottom quartile for all the measurements of academic progress. Which do you choose? Every single one of them chose the second one, wellness. And then I said, okay, cool. Tell me how you measure that in your schools. And there was crickets. We measure what matters. And if you ain't measuring it, it don't matter. And I don't care what you say, kids know. Kids know we care more about their reading scores than we do about their wellness. And as long as that is the case, then schools are morally bankrupt. I'm not saying we shouldn't measure reading. I'm a teacher. Of course I want children to read and write and do math and, and have all the opportunities that, that, that I've had. But when I think about my own sons, I know that if they are well, that when it's time for them to read, they will read. And I also know that if they are not well and they can read and they can do calculus, that I have failed as a father. And I don't see it any different as a teacher. If young people leave my classroom and they do not know about their own sacred value, if they don't see themselves as blessings to this universe because of who they are, and who they come from, and who their ancestors are. I have failed to educate them, but I have schooled them. And as you said in the beginning, so we'll, we'll end where we began. If you are committed to schooling, 
then you are committed to the process by which you institutionalize young people to accept their position in life. And if you are committed to education, then you are committed to the project by which you are helping young people to understand that they can transform that. That is an adult choice. That is each of our choices. And that choice that we make has a massive impact on how young people show up, stay, and leave our spaces. And if I can help you in any way in that former, or excuse me, the latter of those two, the wellness, the education of our children, I'm down. And I can tell you that I don't have all the answers. Every year, I struggle to meet the needs of some of the young people I serve for 30 years. Right? I, I don't have it all figured out. But hey, I am committed to keep banging that drum okay? and to bang that drum alongside of anybody else who is similarly committed because I just don't see any other way for my children to grow up in a society that is truly well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duncan Andrade. I don't know if he never told you, but uh, Jeff was a great basketball player. And I'll have to say that uh, with that finish, I would give him the ball with the last shot in overtime. That was a great finish. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank thanks you. for everybody that tuned in. We're going to be jumping on over to the Jennifer can talk about it, the youth mental health, which is starting uh, two minutes ago, right? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I, let, I, I sent a text and let them know that you guys will be a few minutes late. So um, we should be. Sorry, sorry for taking us into overtime. Yeah. No, it, it was, was great. Good. Thank you, you so much. Shot. You made the shot. <laughs> All right. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Be safe. Be well. Good okay. job, buddy. Thank you.